Welcome to Active Directory Domain Services Overview. I'm Kevin Brown, and I'm going to be your trainer for this lesson. The topics we'll actually cover will include answering the question, exactly what is Active Directory? I'm also going to talk about why a business actually needs Active Directory. I'm going to demonstrate the entire installation of Active Directory. And I'm going to also demonstrate how you can create user accounts, computer accounts, groups, and other objects, and how you can actually manage those through group policy. Be sure to check out our other courses at rtsnetworking.com demo. There are two types of logical network designs that exist. One is called a workgroup, the other is called a domain. A workgroup is synonymous with like a home network. As in very small network, typically less than 20 devices. Now, the easiest way to think about this is to think of it like your home network. Let's say I have four computers in my house. I'm going to say this belongs to Bob. Bob's password is happy trees. So Bob logs in the PC one with that account. PC four belongs to Sally. Sally's password is blue goose. Bob can log into PC one, but only in the PC one. If Bob sits at PC two, three or four and types in the username, Bob, the password, happy trees does not work. He does not have a user account on those computers. Likewise, Sally does not have a user account on any computer other than PC four. Now where these accounts are stored when you're in a work group, like your home network, every computer has something called a SAM stands for security account manager. This SAM is actually a database. It contains the local user accounts. So that SAM database is only resident on the computer you created your user account on. It's not shared or replicated between other computers. Now on a home network, this is probably exactly what I want. If Bob is the dad, he has his PC. If Sally is the mom, Sally has her PC. If you have kids, they have PC two and three. Every person logs into their own PC. The only thing these computers have in common in a work group environment, they all connect to the same network. That is the only commonality between everything configured on one computer is going to be unique to that computer. So as we said, that is probably exactly what you want at home. But now think of this like a work environment. Let's say you have 3000 computers at work. So we'll say 3000 PCs. Imagine if you had to go to each computer and you had to create a user account for that user on that computer. If the user ever forgot their password, you'd have to come back to that computer and you'd have to reset the password on that computer. That is a non workable solution. So what all companies will run will be a domain based environment. A domain based environment builds on this image by adding a domain controller. So we have a Windows server that functions as a domain controller. Now that's always called a DC. This domain controller is actually nothing but a Windows server. I mean, this could be Windows server 2019, 2016, 2012, 2008. Any Windows operating system has the ability to be a domain controller or I should say any Windows Server operating system has the ability to be a domain controller. A domain controller is nothing but a server that you install this software that's called Active Directory. Now everyone calls it Active Directory. The full name is Active Directory Domain Services or ADDS, but it's almost always just called Active Directory and whoever you're talking to, they're clear as to what you mean. When you install Active Directory, this is the software that lets me create user accounts, computer accounts. So let's say we do have 3000 computers and I have 3000 users. I would now go to Active Directory and I would create the user account for Bob. I could define his password. 
So now, when Bob sits at PC1, he logs on, he types in Bob, he types in his password, it sends that request all the way through the network up to a domain controller. The domain controller authenticates those credentials and says, yes, that is the right username, that's the right password, and Bob can log into PC1. But his account does not live in that security account manager, SAM database. It now lives on the domain controller in this Active Directory software, and it's going to be managed from this Active Directory software. If Bob were to quit and I needed to disable his user account, I would do that from the domain controller. If he forgets his password, I would reset that from the domain controller. Everything about his user account is now managed in the Active Directory software on the domain controller, not on the local machine. So what we need to do is install this Active Directory, and we need to look at how do I join this computer to the domain itself so it knows it's supposed to communicate with Active Directory, and how do we get these user accounts created? Before I install Active Directory, there are just a few things you need to make sure you do. One, you need to name the computer. When you install the operating system, Windows generates a default name. It's always W-I-N dash, like random letters and numbers. So you wanna rename it before you install Active Directory to whatever the name actually should be. In my case, I'm gonna name mine RTS-DC1, and you also want to set the IP configuration. The only thing to be aware of when you set the IP configuration, you choose whatever IP address is appropriate, subnet mask, that'll be dictated by the environment you're actually in, or you just click in the box and it'll automatically uh, fill itself in by default. Default gateway, you need that if you want to connect to the internet or to other networks. That's not our interest at the moment, so I'm not going to even define a default gateway. The important setting is the DNS server. I am building the first domain controller in my entire Active Directory domain, so that DNS server has to point back to the local machine. So here, I could set the DNS to be the loopback address, which is 127.001. Or you could actually use the exact IP address of the domain controller that you're on. So I could set it to be 172.16.0.10. Both of these are pretty common. Um, I prefer to use 127.001. Uh, just preference, no reason. The point of this, when we install Active Directory, it has to write a lot of records into this DNS server. Now, the primary purpose of DNS is to take a name and resolve the name to an IP address. Like when you surf the internet and you go to google.com, that name doesn't mean anything to your computer. Your computer has to take the name Google and it has to query these DNS servers to figure out what the IP address of Google actually is. Well, when you install Active Directory, a lot of records have to be created. On the first domain controller, it actually looks at this preferred DNS setting here and it creates all the records on that machine. So I want them created on the machine I'm actually using. So you always set your first domain controller to point to itself for DNS. That's gonna have all those records generated. Now we'll see that in the interface. When you go to configure your client computer, on the IP configuration side, you'll give your client an IP address and the preferred DNS on your client is gonna always be the IP address of your domain controller, your DNS server. Microsoft does recommend as a best practice that your domain controllers also run this DNS service. So whenever my computer now resolves anything by name, it's actually gonna go out through the network and query this machine to look up the name to IP address. If that's a website, a file server, print server, it's going to pass all queries up to that machine. So those are the only prerequisites we need. Before you install AD, make sure you name the computer and you set the IP configuration. I'm now up to my virtual machine that I want to install Active Directory on. All I've actually done is install the operating system and I have defined the name and I have defined the IP address. So I'm going to log into this machine here. 
This server manager will open by default every time you log into the server operating system. If it is not open for you when you log in, you can just go to start and you'll see server manager show up on the start menu. Click that if it didn't open by default. What I can do in server manager is name the computer. Now you'll see just for the sake of time, my computer is already named RTS-DC1. But if I wanted to change that, I could just click that link. I could go to change. And in my system properties here, you just type in the name you actually want. Also notice that this computer is actually in a work group named work group. So it's not joined to a domain. The Active Directory has not been installed yet. I also did define the IP configuration. Here it says Ethernet and I can see my IP address. If you click on that, it'll pull up the network connection. If I double click my network connection and go to properties, you can see TCP IP v4 in the list. If I double click that, you can see the IP address I define, 172.16.0.10, the subnet mask I'm using. I am not using a default gateway. And my preferred DNS server is that loopback address, 127.0.0.1, or you could have made it 172.16.0.10. Same end result, both would be acceptable. So I meet all the prerequisites already. Now to install Active Directory, I'm just gonna click Manage and there's an option to add roles and features. In this before you begin, I'm just gonna click next. You can read over that, but it is just generic information. We are choosing role-based or feature-based installation for Active Directory. So we'll choose next there. This is the machine I'm installing on. So the name of my computer, the IP address, so I'll click next for that. I am just selecting Active Directory Domain Services. When I check that, it gives me this little pop-up window here that basically says these other components are also gonna be installed, so I need to add those. So I'm just gonna click Add Features, and these components are really the management tools, like the ADDS tools, so we'll add features for that. We'll click next. On the features, we are not selecting anything, so we'll just click next. On this Active Directory Domain Services, this is just information. Uh, helps you configure this according to best practices. So it says like things to note, you should have a minimum of two domain controllers so you don't have a single point of failure. Also says Active Directory Domain Services requires a DNS server to be installed. If you don't have one, you'll be prompted to install uh, one on this machine. So that's just informative. But we'll click next there and we will click install. Now what's happening right now is the first part of a two-step process. This installs the role, but then we actually have to go back and configure Active Directory the way we want. So we'll let this install, then we'll walk through the Active Directory promotion wizard. Well, that install has completed. Step two, I can click promote the server to a domain controller, or if you actually close this window, which I do all the time, you can go to this notifications here, this little yellow triangle. If you click that, it also has that same option, promote the server to a domain controller. Well, I'm gonna select that, and we will walk through this wizard. Now, I am creating a brand new Active Directory structure. So what we are assuming is I'm like a new company. I don't have a domain present in the environment or anything like that. So what we will do is create a new forest. A forest in Active Directory can really be just a collection of domains if you're in a larger environment. But the first domain controller you build is always going to be the first domain controller in your entire Active Directory forest. Now, the other two options, which we won't select, one of the notes we saw earlier said, at a minimum, you should have two domain controllers. 
if you have already created Active Directory, I mean, you've already installed it, and you now just want it to be fault tolerant, you would choose option one, add a domain controller to an existing domain. So it would just be like a second domain controller. If I'm in a company that is, say, pretty large or maybe geographically separated, if you have an office in the UK and an office in Canada, you may create separate domains, one for Canada, one for the UK. If you have an office in the US, that may be a separate domain. If that's true, you'll have this parent-child relationship. That is this option to add a new domain to an existing forest. We're not concerned with any of those details because again, we are creating a brand new forest from scratch. So add a new forest. It says, what do you want to name this? Well, I'm going to name it rts.local. I'm going to just click next for that. It'll verify that name is not already in use in the environment, so it takes just a second. Now it says, what domain controller options do you want? I can set these functional levels, 2008, you know, 2012. The functional level does nothing but enable features in newer operating systems. So if all your domain controllers run Windows Server 2016, you can set your functional level to be Server 2016 and any new features associated with Active Directory on Server 2016 will be enabled. I can tell you for a fact, there are very few enhancements at functional levels. The only big functional level was actually Server 2008 R2. If you chose that functional level, then all your domain controllers had to run 2008 R2 or newer. And if you did that, you could enable this recycle bin for Active Directory. So if you deleted a user, you could go to this recycle bin and you could just restore the user directly from there. Other than that, the changes are actually fairly small changes. I'm going to leave those on the default. I do not have a DNS server, so I'm going to leave my DNS checked. And the last thing we're going to do here is set this directory services restore mode password. If I ever have to restore this from a backup, I would need to use the password I defined here. So it just requires you to type a password. So I'll enter that and we'll just click next. It says a delegation for this DNS server cannot be created because an authoritative parent zone cannot be found. All that means is this could not find a DNS server. So it's going to install DNS for us and fully configure it. So you'll always see this show up when you build a new forest. It just looks alarming because it has that warning triangle in it, but it is not. So I'm going to choose next for that. It'll take just a moment and it's going to tell me my NetBIOS domain name, which is always the name of your domain without the extension. Like I named this rts.local. The NetBIOS name is going to be just RTS. So I'll click next for that. And we're actually almost done. Active Directory is actually a database. It's truly a database that contains the user accounts, computer accounts, and all these other objects. This path is just the location. Now I'm going to leave all these in the default location. But C Windows NTDS is going to contain my Active Directory database, which is actually a 20 meg database file by default. So very small. We also have all these transaction logs that goes to the same location, C Windows NTDS. And it also creates this sysfall folder. This is actually going to be a shared folder that contains policies and a handful of other settings. We are going to leave those in the default location. So I'm not changing anything here. I'm just going to click next. These are all the options we defined. I'm going to click next. It's going to make sure we meet the prerequisites, which we will. As soon as that is done, we're going to click install and this machine will become a domain controller in our new RTS.local forest. So it says we passed all the prerequisite checks here. So we'll just click install. That is all there ever is to create a new domain, build a new Active Directory forest. It's going to take maybe five minutes or so for that to install. The machine has to reboot. 
But every domain in the world started exactly that way with someone installing Active Directory on a single server. Our install is done. It says I'm going to be signed out and it's going to automatically reboot. And this machine will now run Active Directory and will be a domain controller. The Active Directory install has completed. My server has rebooted. So now I'm going to log in to my RTS domain. Administrator is my username that I'm using, and I'm just going to type in my password. We are now authenticating with our Active Directory account. A few things are notably different. One, if I click on this local server, you can see the domain now says rts.local. And over here on the left, I also have this ADDS for Active Directory Domain Services. This is actually called a server group, but this will give you a list of like all the domain controllers you have in your environment. And I also have this DNS that was installed that shows up. You'll always see this ADDS on all your domain controllers. If I go to tools, I see several options for Active Directory. The only one we care about for this lesson is Active Directory Users and Computers. So if I pull that up, this is my domain, rts.local. That's the name I selected when I installed Active Directory. I have a few objects that show up here. These are containers and organizational units. I'm gonna just slide that over a bit. If I go to this users container, these are the default accounts that exist. This is my administrator user account. The ones with like two heads would be groups. So I have a few user accounts and a handful of groups that exist by default. I can create new users here as well. An example would be if my company did hire a new user named Bob. I'm just going to click this new user icon here. Or if you cancel that, you can just right click this container users and there's a new option and you get an option for computer group user and several other objects. So I'm going to click new user here. The first name of my person is Bob. I'm going to say the last name is Ross. Now for Bob, I'm going to say the user login is B Ross. So first initial, last name. And we'll just choose next for that. I'm gonna set Bob's password. I'm gonna leave selected. User must change password and next logon. It would violate every security principle we have if I was able to know my user's passwords. So when Bob logs in the very first time, it's gonna force him to actually change that password. Well, I'm going to click next and finish. Now I have my user, Bob Ross. Bob can go log on to other computers in the environment. He's a fully functioning user. Now, another common object we have in Active Directory is a group. Let's say Bob works in the sales department. I'm going to right click users again and I'm gonna create a new group this time. In the group name, I'm just gonna name it sales. And I'm just gonna click okay. And a sales group now shows up in the list here. Well, I'm gonna open that sales group. So when I double click that, it gives me the properties. There is a members tab here. If I select members, I have the option to add a user to this group. So at the bottom here, I'm gonna click add. Now you could just type in like Bob, but I'm gonna click advanced and find now instead of just doing a search by name. But this gives me a list of all the users and groups I have. I'm gonna just select Bob Ross out of that list and click okay and okay. Now you can see that Bob Ross is listed under this member section here. So I'm gonna click okay for that. Bob is now a member of this group. 
The purpose of that, if I just go back to the desktop of this machine here, on my desktop, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to name the folder sales data. I want Bob Ross to have access to this and all other users in the sales department need to be able to read what's in this folder. That's where the concept of Active Directory groups come into play. If I right click this folder and go to properties, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to click the sharing tab and under this advanced sharing, I'm just going to click share this folder and I'm going to click OK. Now to take a look at that, I'm actually going to right click on start and I'm going to go to run. And in run, I'm going to type backslash backslash the name of my local machine, RTS dash DC1. Now what this does is actually launch a network connection, but it's going to connect to my machine so I can see any shared resources I have from my machine's point of view. When I click OK, you'll see sales data shows up as a shared folder. So we know that's accessible across the network now. Where Active Directory groups come into play, I can limit what you can do with this. So when I click the security tab, I'm going to click edit and add, and I'm just going to type in SA and this check names. It's going to search and the only thing I have in Active Directory, user or group, that starts with SA is this sales group. So I'm gonna click okay for that. That's my sales group. Now I can set the level of permissions I want them to have. If I want them to just have read access, read and write, full control, uh, whatever your needs dictate. But that would be the purpose of a group. If I have multiple users that need access to the same shared folder or same application, it's too tedious to individually assign permissions to users. That is never recommended. Instead, you would always create a group, add the users as members of that group, then you simply assign permissions to the group. So that would be our group purpose. But if we go back to Active Directory, so that's a, a brief overview of the user account itself and the group. The other thing we want to touch on is the computer account. If I go back to computers, I have no computers joined to my domain right now. The typical way a computer is added to the domain is from the computer itself. We'll go to our client machine and we'll join that client machine to the domain. When we do that, it automatically creates a computer object is what it's called. This computer object by default goes under this computer's container. So let's take a look at that from the client point of view and see if we can get a computer joined to our rts.local domain. Be sure to check out my other courses I have hosted on the Udemy website. I have about 30,000 students. I have courses that range from Azure Administration to Azure Fundamentals, PowerShell courses, Security, Hyper-V. I also have courses that cover Server Administration, Group Policy, and Active Directory. These courses are some of the best sellers on the Udemy website, so be sure to check them out. The link is in the description below. So now I'm on a different machine and I want to take this computer and join it to the rts.local domain. The things we need to check. I'm going to go to start and I'm going to open control panel. And in control panel, I'm going to go to system. Now the reason I use control panel and system is because it is consistent across all Microsoft operating systems. You could be on Windows Vista, which no one would use, but Windows 8, 8, 1, 10, uh, server operating systems. If you go to control panel, you're always going to have this uh, computer name, domain, workgroup show up here. So you can see my computer is currently named RTSCL1. That's what I want. And right now it's in a workgroup. So that is what we want to change. I'm also going to check the network settings. So I'm going to right click my little network icon here and open network and sharing center. And I'm going to click on ethernet and I'm just going to go to the properties. 
TCP IP version 4. And you can see my IP address is already defined. 172.16.0.11. That's the configuration I want on this machine. And if you remember, 172.16.0.10 is the IP address of my domain controller, the RTS DC1, which is also a DNS server. So that's already correct. So all I'm going to do is join this to the domain. On this change settings, I'm just going to go to change. And I'm going to select member of domain. And I'll just type in the name of the domain, which is rts.local. That'll prompt me for credentials for the rts.local domain. So I'm going to use my administrator and the password for that account. We'll just click OK. That says welcome to the domain. So I'm just going to click OK and this machine will reboot. And now it's a member of a domain. So we'll say close and restart now. As this restarts, we're going to switch back to our domain controller. So as the other machine reboots, this computer's container we looked in just a moment ago was blank here. If I click refresh, you can see RTS-CL1 now shows up as a member of the domain. So I have my computer joined to the domain, so it can now be managed through Active Directory. I have my user, Bob Ross, so the user account can be managed through Active Directory. If you are in an environment with thousands of users, all your users have been added to Active Directory in a similar fashion. All the computers your users actually use have been added to Active Directory in a similar fashion. Pretty fascinating and very straightforward. Now, the other thing we want to touch on is how this gets organized. I'm going to click on my domain, rts.local. Notice when you look at this, if I slide some of these over a little bit so it's a little easier to read. Notice under type, some of these say container, and only one of these says organizational unit. And if you look at the icon, notice the ones that say container, they have this blank folder icon. The one organizational unit, which is domain controllers, it has this little icon in the center of the folder. Now that's supposed to be a book in the center of the folder. The difference between a container and an organizational unit, the primary difference, an organizational unit allows you to apply group policies to it. Group policy gives me more than 3,000 settings that I can use to manage computer accounts and user accounts. Now, containers are created by default. The user's container is present and it has some default accounts in it. The computer's container is always present. And by default, when you join a computer to the domain, that's where it shows up in Active Directory. But what we do to structure this is we create organizational units. An example, I'm going to right click my domain and I'm going to go to new organizational unit. Now, how you structure these organizational units, that is different from company to company. So there is not a right or wrong way. It would be very specific to exactly your organizational needs. But the common ways you see this are based on location and based on department. For example, let's say I have a location in Atlanta. I'm going to create an organizational unit named Atlanta. So I'm going to click OK for that. And I also have a location in Boston. I'm going to right click my domain again, new organizational unit. This one I'm going to name Boston. So Every location I have offices, I could create an organization unit to represent those locations to organize these objects. Well, under Atlanta, I'm going to create an OU, like a child OU. Sometimes it's referred to as a sub OU. But I'm going to name this one users. So if you are a user and you are in Atlanta, your account goes to this location. I'm going to create another for computer accounts. So new organizational unit, computers. Again, how you structure this depends on what your needs are. 
Very often you'll see under Atlanta, you'll see like a sales OU, a marketing OU. So it depends on what your needs are for these organizational units, which are almost always referred to as OUs because it simply takes too long to say organizational unit. But the easiest way to think of this, and you will never be confused, think of it like a folder. If you create a folder on your desktop and you named it My Personal Finances, why would you do that? Two reasons. You want to take all your personal financial documentation and you want to put it in a single folder so it's organized for you. That's reason one, organization of like items or like objects. The other reason, you want to essentially manage it. You put all your financial documents into the folder. You can then apply permissions to the folder to say, I'm the only one that can access this folder. You determine permissions and you organize like objects together. Everywhere in Microsoft you see a folder icon, it serves the same purpose. Group like objects together, and then you can centrally manage those objects. What I mean by that? I'm going to click this user's container, and I'm going to find Bob Ross. Now, I can right-click and move is an option, and I could select like my you know Atlanta users. But I want to click cancel there. Usually what I do is just click and drag. And I can drag Bob to that users. Now, when I click on this users organizational unit, uh, Bob Raw shows up there. I could go to the computers container for my RTS, that CL1. I could drag that to the Atlanta computers. You'll see some environments will have a computers OU like this. And under it, they'll have a child OU for desktops, another for laptops. So how it's structured depends on really the environment you're actually in. But as I said earlier, one of the key considerations is applying group policy objects. Group policy is how we manage all these settings. So an example of this, I right now have an OU named Domain Controllers. I have an Atlanta OU with a users and computers OU under it and a Boston OU. All the others are containers, like this users container, computers container. What I'm going to do is go back to my server manager. And in server manager, I'm going to go to tools. And under tools, I'm going to click on group policy management. Under this group policy management, I'm going to expand my forest, I'm going to expand my domains, and I'm going to expand rts.local. I'm also going to put this in full screen so it's easier to see. But notice you don't see the user's container, you don't see the computer's container show up here. What we're getting is the organizational unit. So I have Atlanta with the computer's user's OU under it, and I have the Boston and domain controller's OU. None of the containers show up here. So what does that mean? It means you cannot directly create a policy and apply it to that location. Now, to look at a few interesting settings in a policy, I'm going to set the wallpaper and I'm going to define some power settings. But before we do that, we want to verify how our other system looks right now. So I'm going to switch back to that RTS-CL1. So on my RTSCL1, I'm going to log in as that Bob Ross, or B Ross was the username, and I'm going to enter the password. It says user's password must be changed before signing in because we left that checkbox set, you'll remember. I'm going to say OK because I have to reset it. And I'm going to type in a new password. And we'll just sign in. That password is actually now changed in Active Directory. Now Bob Ross is signed on. Two things I want to show you. Now, the reason I show you this is just so it's clear that we have managed some of these settings through policy. When this comes up, notice the wallpaper is the default Windows wallpaper. And I'm also going to right click start and I'm going to choose power options off the start menu. 
And under power options, I have this balanced and high performance, uh, my power plans they are. And if I click this down arrow to show additional, there is only this power saver that shows up. I'm actually gonna click this chain settings that are currently unavailable, just so they're a little easier to see. They're not like hidden, but I only have three. We are gonna change that through group policy. So I'm gonna switch back to our other machine, the domain controller. I'm back on my domain controller. What I've actually done is copy over a wallpaper I just downloaded from the internet. And I also am gonna set the power options. So the first thing I'm gonna do, on my desktop here, I'm just gonna, for demo purposes, I'm gonna create a new folder and I'm gonna name it wallpaper. I'm gonna right click the folder. I'm gonna to go to properties. And on this sharing tab, I'm just gonna click advanced sharing and select share this folder and okay. I'm not gonna change permissions or anything like that on the sharing tab. And on the security tab, I'm just gonna click edit and add and I'm gonna put this authenticated users. So I'm gonna type A-U-T-H and just click check names. That does a quick search and I'll see authenticated users is here in the list. So I'm just gonna choose that authenticated users and okay, and okay. And you'll see that has like read, read, execute, list folder contents, that's fine. Now an authenticated users, anyone that logs in will have you know read access to this. That's what we want. So I'm gonna okay that and close. And I'm gonna take this oranges wallpaper and I'm gonna drag it into that shared folder. So now that folder is network accessible. I'm gonna switch back to my group policy management console and I'm gonna do two things. Under this Atlanta OU, I have this users OU I created. I'm gonna right click that OU and there is an option to create a GPO, which stands for group policy object in this domain and link it here. I'm gonna choose that and I'm gonna name this GPO wallpaper we'll just okay that and now if i expand users this wallpaper shows up get rid of some of these pop-ups here i'm gonna right click that wallpaper uh, gpo and edit now there are more than 3,000 settings in group policy so much so i have a dedicated course just that covers group policy and a separate dedicated course that just covers Active Directory. But for the wallpaper, it's kind of a basic setting we can define. Under my user configuration, I'm gonna click Policies, Administrative Templates. I'm gonna expand Desktop, pull this over a bit, and there's this Desktop folder under it, and there is Desktop Wallpaper. All I need to do is specify the path for that wallpaper. So I'm gonna click enabled and I'm gonna type in the shared path for that or UNC path is what it's known as but most people call it a share. Backslash backslash RTS dash DC one backslash wall paper backslash oranges dot JPG. Now, I don't want this centered, so I'm gonna set this to fill, just so it consumes the entire desktop. And I'm gonna drag that up so I can click the OK button. So that should set the wallpaper under this uh, GPO, and that GPO is linked to the Atlanta users. If there are a thousand users under this OU, a thousand users now will have that wallpaper set. Now I'm gonna to go to the computers under Atlanta and I'm gonna create another GPO. And I'm gonna name this one Power Settings. I'm gonna right click that GPO and edit. For this one, I'm gonna expand my computer configuration, preferences, control panel settings. You'll see under control panel settings, there's a power options. So I'm gonna right click that and I'm gonna create a new 
power plan says at least Windows 7. So Windows 7 and newer, this is the power plan you would create. Under action, I'm gonna choose create, and I'm gonna name this power plan go green, exclamation marks. Now, I don't wanna actually have this be the active power plan on my system, so I'm not going to click this set as the active power plan. I'm going to leave that deselected. But just remember we named this Go Green. And I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to close that GPO. If there are a thousand computers under this computers OU here, thousand computers now have this power plan. Now let's take a look to see if that actually has taken effect. I'm back on my RTS CL1 machine. So I have the wallpaper we started with, and I don't have the power options. Now, what you can do many times is you can actually type GP update, and many things will take effect. I'm actually going to do that right now. Well, I'm going to show you one thing before I do that. I'm going to click power options, and I'm going to choose that uh, chain settings that are currently unavailable, just so it's easier to see. But notice I only have the three options. Like if we refresh, still the three options. What I'm gonna do is right click and go to run. And in run, I'm gonna type GP update. GP update just tells my computer, go back to the domain controller and check for any updates to any policies. So I'm gonna click okay for that. And it says updating policy. And in a moment, it's going to say computer configuration. Uh, it's updated. It's going to reference user configuration. So there I can see the computer side's already done. User side's done. If we refresh this view now, it's like magic. My go green shows up in the list. Now, what's interesting is the wallpaper did not change. Some settings can be updated in the background. Some settings require you to either reboot the machine if it's a computer setting. Some user settings require you to simply log off and log back on. The background does not update in the background, or I should say the wallpaper does not upgrade in the background. It requires me to sign out, sign back in. So we're going to do that. But we see the power setting has already taken effect through policy. So on the system here, I'm just going to sign out and sign right back in. And I want to sign back in as B Ross with my same password. We have a lovely wallpaper. Okay, maybe not lovely. But we know our policy worked because my wallpaper is now a bunch of oranges. So very similar to how you kind of manage your own local machine, I can go to group policy and I can manage 3,000 plus settings across all the computers in my entire domain. That could be tens of thousands of computers. You can dictate wallpaper if I want to block USB drives numerous settings. Um, if you can think of it, you can pretty much manage it, restrict it through policy. So we know our client machine is configured, joined to the domain, everything's working. Now earlier, I did also say that Active Directory is a database server. I'm gonna, on my domain controller, I'm just gonna go through File Explorer. And in File Explorer, I'm gonna navigate through this PC to the C drive, the Windows folder, there is a folder named NTDS in that list. If we click that, this NTDS.dip, 20 megs in size, that is the Active Directory database file. You'll see some log files also show up here, but every user account you create, every computer account, the groups, organizational units, all that lives in that ntds.dit database file. So to summarize this, Active Directory is a role we install on Windows Server. 
Once you install it, the machine it's installed on is now referred to as a domain controller. The benefits of Active Directory is centralized administration. I create policies that allow me to manage all my users, all my computers, and the other is centralized authentication. I no longer go out to individual computers and create user accounts or reset passwords. All that is done in Active Directory on the domain controller. Now, as we saw earlier, you should have at a minimum two domain controllers. What's very neat in Active Directory is Active Directory actually replicates all of its objects. So if I do have two domain controllers, I could create my user like I did Bob on one domain controller. That user then replicates to the other. So you never double your work. If I disable a user count on one, the fact that it's disabled gets replicated to the other domain controllers. So it does not matter where you make a change, it replicates to your other domain controllers. Now this is intended to serve as an overview just to give you an understanding of Active Directory. If you want to check out additional courses I have, look at the links below and you can take a deep dive through some of these topics. If you want to learn more, visit us on the web at rtsnetworking.com demo, where we have free demo videos and I also have courses on sale for as low as $9.99 covering various Microsoft topics. Be sure to check out my other courses I have hosted on the Udemy website. I have about 30,000 students. I have courses that range from Azure Administration to Azure Fundamentals, PowerShell courses, Security, Hyper-V. I also have courses that cover Server Administration, Group Policy, and Active Directory. These courses are some of the best sellers on the Udemy website, so be sure to check them out. The link is in the description below.